Hey scholars, good to be back with you. This is another in a series of videos about statics and today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about trusses. Now trusses are really important in the built world and they're all around us if you know to look for them. I'm at Purdue University and we've got quite a few construction projects going on right now. So there's tower cranes everywhere. Well those tower cranes are made out of trusses. If you look at one of the earlier videos, um, I got some good pictures of them. If I look in some of the buildings around here, I see the ceilings, the roofs, the floors, sometimes held up by trusses. Now trusses are important in statics because they're, they can be fairly complicated, fairly sophisticated, but they're made out of very simple elements that are easy to analyze. So they're a good starting point for classes and structural analysis. And the way the process typically works in your education, if you haven't done this yet, is we'll start at statics, then we'll go to strength of materials, and then to finite element analysis. But we need to start somewhere, and that somewhere is statics, and we're going to work with trusses. Before I talk a little bit about how we're going to work with them, let's just look at some examples. Let's make sure we know what we're talking about here. The place we, a lot of us have seen trusses is in old-fashioned bridges, those old built-up bridges that are made out of beams all pinned together. But there's a lot more modern examples. Here's a picture of the, one of the solar arrays on the International Space Station. Now those gold panels are the solar cells themselves. That's what turns sunlight into electricity. And in between them, you can see there's a very delicate but fairly complex truss. Now that truss gets to be very, very light because since they're in orbit, there's no weight acting on the space station. The truss doesn't have to support the weight of the solar panels, it only has to support flight loads, so it gets to be very light. If you want to go to the sort of the other end of the scale, just this big, beefy one, here's a picture of a floating crane. Now when I first saw this, I didn't quite understand what it was. It wasn't clear that it's a crane, but that's what it is. It's got two sort of assemblies in it. One is the yellow part and the other is the white part. Now notice that as, as complicated as that is, it's still pretty much built up of straight sections. It's basically made out of sticks. Now, not really. The sticks are probably steel and they're probably hollow. They're either welted or bolted together most likely. But for our purposes, that looks an awful lot like a truss. The yellow part is floating on barges. This thing is floating. The white part goes below the surface of the water to clamp onto something they want to lift. Now if I understand this correctly, it was originally designed to go after parts of oil rigs and maybe sunken oil rigs. It wasn't clear from the uh, uh, description I read. So let's go for something more sophisticated now. When the shuttle was still flying, sometimes it would land in California and sometimes it would land in Florida. Well, it had to be processed in Florida, so sometimes they had to fly it from California to Florida. Well, how do you do that? Well, you stick it on the back of a great big airplane like a 747. Well, how do you get it onto the back of the plane? Well, here's a picture of the um, mating assembly, this big gantry that lifts the space shuttle up, this giant thing that is itself the size of an airliner, and sticks it on the back of that 747. If you look, you can see how complicated that truss is. Now, if you want to go back to construction, which is a place where you see a lot of these, here's a picture of two very large cranes being used to assemble a building, to, to put up a building. Now, these are the red parts are the cranes, and these are very large. These are about as large as a mobile crane could be. And you can see that the booms on the cranes are uh, trusses, as are parts of the building. And finally, just to bring it on home to something you might see in your day-to-day -day life, here's a picture of, it looks like an auditorium or perhaps a conference room or something, and it's got a truss structure holding the ceiling up, the interior part of the top of the, of the building. And the, the, for aesthetic reasons, they left the truss on the outside. I kind of like this. So, next time you're in a big building, maybe an airport or an auditorium or a stadium or something like that, start looking around chances are you'll start to see some trusses. So we can agree that they're everywhere. The reason they're everywhere, they must be pretty handy. They must be a really effective way to solve structural problems. The reason we're interested in them in statics is they're also relatively simple to analyze if we make some assumptions. Now, with any structural analysis, you gotta say, what analysis, I don't know what that means. What do you mean by an analysis? Well, 
An analysis is when you make a mathematical description of a structure, you draw pictures of it, and you start writing out equations describing how the structure is going to act under load. Mathematically, you apply loads to that structure, and then you start calculating what the forces and the stresses are in the structure to find out if it can do its job. If it can't, it might fall over. That's generally bad. So here's the process you're going to learn in statics. And the process has four steps. Almost all statics problems follow these four steps. In fact, most strength and materials problems do as well. And if you're uh, set it up right, dynamics problems do too. Check out some of my videos. Um, here's the, the name of the, the YouTube channel if you haven't run across that yet. The example I'm going to show is just going to be conceptual. I'm not going to work through all the numbers because that would take forever. Um, I just want to get the big ideas across. Go on this channel. There's the, a playlist for st statics and there's also a playlist for strength of materials. And there's quite a few problems where I start at the very beginning, work through all the numbers, show you what all the intermediate steps are so you can check your work and I get us to a numerical answer. But that's kind of involved. We're not going to do that right now. So to keep things moving, let's just draw a truss. And here's, you know, they can look like anything, but here's the kind of thing you'll see in class a lot. And what we're going to need to get used to is the idea of abstraction. We're going to take, you know, possibly fairly sophisticated, whoops, sophisticated structures, and we're going to try to represent them as simply as we can. So just make sure I got that in there. Okay. So this is might be a, a maybe a crane or a, a structure to, designed to support a load. And there's the load right there. This is pretty abstract, isn't it? Well, if I went through and tried to draw all the little details of it, I would be adding a lot of complication, but it really wouldn't be any more useful. So let's just take a look at this. This is, this is step number one in the process. Now the process has four steps. Step one, working diagram. This is a working diagram. It tells you what the structure is going to look like, gives you uh, usually dimensions, it gives you the information you need to know to start your analysis. Step two is going to be a free body diagram. Now that's a very simplified version of this that has only the loads on it. That's the one you use to actually start writing equations. Step three, write equations. Step four, solve. So those are the steps. Working diagram, free body diagram, write equations, solve for something. Those are the steps in a, in a structural analysis. So here's step one, and I got to. This is, becomes kind of a bookkeeping exercise at some point. I'm going to number those two nodes uh, one and two. I guess we'll call this three, and we'll call that four. Although I don't think we'll need three or four. Those little hash marks there. That means that's our uh, uh, like a visual shorthand, a visual notation that says. This structure that we care about is stuck to something massive and rigid. I don't know what's over here. I don't care. Whatever's going on over here, we don't care about. Just pretend it's stuck to some just enormous block of concrete or something. This is the part over here that we care about. right? That's a working diagram. So that's step one. Now, this will have dimensions and forces and things like that. In order to do the analysis, we'll have to know what that force is. So let's go back to what is this thing? What does it look like? Well, it could be a crane. It could be maybe if this was in construction, this would be part of a crane. It would be lifting uh, buckets of concrete. Maybe it's in a warehouse and it's lifting pallets of materials. Maybe it's in uh, a, a garage and we're lifting engine blocks with it. Who knows? But the part of it we care about boils down to this. So that's our working diagram. Next thing we're going to write is our draw is our uh, free body diagram. And that's going to have uh, the information we need to start calculating loads. Now, statics assumes that the structure is rigid. It assumes there are no deformations. The reason we assume that is because it makes the math very simple. The downside is it introduces some error. So when you do statics, you're getting an approximate solution. When you go to strength of materials and include the deformation of the materials, well, the downside is the math gets a little harder. The upside is the answer is more accurate. So this is a great place to start. And people have designed uh, very successful structures for centuries, really, doing this. Okay? Go, how do you think they did the Eiffel Tower? It had to be something about like this. All right, so there's the working diagram. Let's go to our free body diagram. Now, generally what we do in finding loads is we start at one end and just sort of work to the other end. Well. If I already know this structure is rigid, 
Let's start by finding the reaction forces there and there. Well, if all I want to know is those two, I don't care what the rest of this looks like yet. I will eventually, but not yet. So let's just draw it, just draw the outer sort of envelope of it, I guess. So there it is, and there's my force. Okay, so this and this are the same, sort of. This is just the outer envelope. I don't care what's going on inside yet. It doesn't matter yet because I only want to know what the loads are at the interface, at the outsides of it. Now before I get too far, if I'm going to write equations, I've got to have a coordinate system. If you don't know what else to do, use this for a coordinate system. There are reasons to use, oops, not F, Y. There are reasons to use other coordinate systems, and if you have one of those reasons, that's fine. But if you don't have a reason, use this one. If you do the same thing every time, you tend to mess up less, or at least I do. So positive x goes to the right, positive y goes up, and positive moment is counterclockwise. Well, the reason it's counterclockwise is a right-handed coordinate system. Now, I'm left-handed, so I can write and do this at the same time. Um, so what I can do is say x rotated into y, Z points out this way, that makes that a positive moment. Remember, physics doesn't care about coordinate systems. Physics just works. It doesn't know what our coordinate systems are. So as long as you execute the steps correctly, you can use any coordinate system you want. I'm going to use this one. So now I need to do a little bookkeeping here. Let's find the forces acting on my structure here at this interface, at the, at the uh, place where it's uh, connected. And I'm going to call this, let me get that out of the way, Okay, that's F1x, F at grid point 1 in the x direction, and I'm going to call this F1y, so the force is at grid point 1 in the y direction. And you can see that bookkeeping is important here. It's going to get, the, the more uh, complicated the structures get, the more involved this gets. It's not hard, it's just tedious. Um, and there's, that's going to be F2x. Notice there is no F2y, and the reason there's no F2y is that that's pinned there and that's pinned there. Remember, this is a pinned truss. There's no moments anywhere. It's, it's literally a pivot there. Okay? And because of that, there can't be any vertical force here. So I've only really got three forces, three external forces, reaction forces that I want to know. So how am I going to do that? Well, it's time to write some equations. Equations of static equilibrium. And the whole idea of, of statics is some of the forces in the x direction has to be zero, some of the forces in the y direction has to be zero, and the sum of the moments have to be zero. If those aren't zero, it means the thing's moving and it's not statics. Now you're, there's another class called dynamics where the forces don't add up to zero. Right? For now, we want this to be static, we want our structures to be static, so all the forces have to add up to zero. Well, I can start those three equations, I can do them in any order I want. Well. I've done this a few times before, and I know that if I start by uh, figuring out the sum of the moments about that point right there, the moment arm on F1y and F1x are both zero, so they drop out. There's only one unknown and one known, so I get one equation, one unknown, that's great. Well, I've done this a few times before. If you're new to this and you don't happen to do it in the order I do it, and that's fine, you'll get the same answer. All right, so I will write the sum of the, the moments about that point equals zero. Then I'm going to write the sum of, I don't know, let's go for so, some of the forces in the y direction. Well, I know that force and that force have to add up to zero. They're point opposite directions, so f has, has to equal f1y. And what I would do is I would write out the forces in the y direction equal to zero. Write that equation. The next one, the sum of the forces in the x direction has to be zero. Now these point the same way. They can't add up to zero. Well, they can if one of them is negative, and one of them will be. All right? I'm not going to guess because I, I want to I make sure and run the math and make sure I knew which one is which. I think that one's negative. I think. But I'm going to do what the math tells me to do. I'm not going to guess. All right? So um, if that turns out to be negative, all that means is, all a negative number means is your assumed direction is incorrect. The force or the moment is acting in the other direction from the one you assumed. That's okay. There's nothing wrong. You haven't made an error. There's no problem. It just means that you've got a negative force now. Well, that's fine. Carry that negative through the, the problem and you'll get the right answer at the end. 
So uh, work those all out, and eventually I'm going to get all three of those. Once I have those, the three uh, forces at those two points, I'm going to need to start figuring out the, point, the forces in my other four elements. And there's really two ways to do this. One is called the method of sections. And all we do there is we make some fictitious cuts and we start figuring out forces um, at those cuts, those mathematical cuts. You don't actually go up and cut something in two, but you do it mathematically. And the other one is called the method of joints, which I know, it's a great, great name, huh? And all the method of joints does is has you draw free body diagrams at those pinned joints. You look at the forces coming in, you look at the forces coming out. There are no moments because that's a pivot. It can, the, the joint can't, uh, there's no reaction moment there. It can't uh, support a moment. So it's really only forces in the x direction and forces in the y direction at those joints. For a complicated problem, sometimes you'll use both the method of sections and the method of joints in different parts of the problem. That's okay too. They are mathematically equivalent. You can combine them as you wish and as long as you do the problem correctly, you'll get the right answer. So let's just review here real quick. Trusses are everywhere around us. All you have to do is start looking for them. They're in cranes, they're in buildings, they're in boats, planes, they're all over the place. They're really handy. You're able to make a fairly complicated structure out of an assembly of very simple components if you use a truss. They scale very readily. You can make really big structures out of trusses. They are mathematically fairly simple to work with, and because of that, they're one of the first things we study in statics. And we've gone through the process of how to deal with a truss structure in statics. So I hope this helps, and we'll talk to you next time.